Welcome back to part two of High Level Entertainment Stunning Bishop Moves. This is FM Mike Klein, and I want to show you one of my favorite moves I ever studied when I was a child. I remember the day my chess coach showed me this move, and I just sat there in awe because I just could not believe that somebody could have considered this move. This is one of the more famous examples I'm showing you today, so some of you might already know the secret, but there's a couple backstories with this game. This is a game that Walter Brown played in 1974. That was the year he won the first of his six U.S. championships. And he was playing Grandmaster Arthur Bisquire, the Dean of American Chess. The story is that he spent about 45 minutes on this move. It's not clear if somebody else knew of this move before he did, but what is pretty clear to me is that he found this move over the board. Because if he actually had studied this move before the game, why would you spend 45 minutes unless you're just all about the theatrics of making it look like you found it over the board? I don't think that's what happened here in this game. I think he actually had to analyze all the variations. The other cool thing about this position is that it's a great way to stump 2,000 level players. I teach a lot of chess camps every summer, and sometimes when I need 10 minutes to fill at the end of class, I throw this position up and I tell my entire class of students, okay, you get 10 guesses to find White's winning move. Usually, even in 10 guesses, a whole classroom full of chess experts can't find it. What do they think of first? Well, they think of pretty natural moves. They think of rook takes bishop. They think of moves like queen b4. They think of moves like bishop to g5. Rook e5 usually gets thrown in the mix. And all of these are reasonable moves, but none of them quite win. Like, for example, let's just say you try the move rook to e5. The queen will go back to d7. That's rather forced. And if you try a move like, I don't know, let's say queen to b4, although it looks like white's attack is very promising, black can defend with bishop e6, unpinning his bishop, and black tends to survive in all these positions. I'll let you work out all of the other candidate moves that I showed you, but suffice to say, this is why Walter Brown probably spent 45 minutes on this move. He uncorked the amazing bishop to h6. What does this move do? Okay, well, first of all, it connects the rooks. We see that. Secondly, it wins a tempo. Black can't just very well continue his development because he's got to worry about his pawn on e6. You know, Black would have liked to have played bishop e6 to block off the e-file to allow his king to castle. Well, he can't play that now. He just lose a pawn. And the third thing it does is it very sneakily opens up this diagonal. It's very well known. When you have isolated queen pawns, you want to be able to advance them. Now, black's doing a good job of blockading, but queens don't make good blockaders because when they get attacked, they have to run away. Now, in the game, black actually chickened out. Black played rook to g8. We're not going to show what happened in the game because I'm more interested in what happens if the bishop was captured. If the bishop gets captured, now rook to e5 does what we wanted it to do. It breaks through. The queen has to run away. Queen to d7 is the only way to keep control of the bishop. White now doubles rooks on e1. Uh-oh. Rook takes e7 looks pretty devastating. When the bishop moves back, now the isolated queen pawn lurches forward. And you can see the opening of this diagonal is going to pay dividends for white. Black pretty much has to capture. Otherwise, white will just take on e6 and expose the e-file. And now white plays the fairly obvious sacrifice. Rook takes e6. And after pawn takes, queen takes, white has recovered pretty much all of his material. Black technically has an extra pawn, although these doubled pawns on the h-file don't really count. Well, the only way to not lose the rook on a8 is to play bishop to f8. And now I think the most accurate move for white is queen f6, still not letting black get his king out of the middle of the chessboard. Of course, we're threatening e6 twice. There's not really a way for black to save it. And I think it's just a winning position for white. Let's just say black tries to move bishop to e7. Rook takes pawn is a great way of guarding your queen. And now black better be careful because knight e5 is coming. And when the queen moves, we're going to have mate on h8. That's why Bisquire decided to play rook to g8 and decline the bishop on h6. But once again, bishop h6, one of the most stunning moves I ever saw as a child. Now, by the way, Walter Brown, I'm going to let you stump 2,000 level players even more. Walter Brown is the answer to an obscure trivia question. Here it is. Which American has won the most games in a single Olympiad? The answer? It's Walter Brown. The trick is that he actually played for the Australian team at the time. In 1972, he played the second of two Olympiads for Australia, 
he scored 17 and a half points in Skopje, Macedonia. Back then it was Yugoslavia. So there you go. Another great position or trivia question you can use to stump your strong chess playing friends. All right, I think I found a very similar position to show you. This is Kasparov short many years after their world championship match. You can see Kasparov is starting to throw his pieces at Black's King. The question is how to continue the invasion. Kasparov finds the stunning Bishop H6. That should ring a bell by now. Hey, funny how these positions work out well together. There's not really a good way for Black to guard this pawn on G7 a second time. So unlike Bisquire, Short has to accept the sacrifice. But that allows the Queen to come up to D2, and there's no way to prevent the Queen's invasion on H6. If the Queen gets a free move and takes on H6, it's immediate mate on G7. So it's desperation time already for Nigel Short. He tried F5, and White calmly took en passant. You can't really even sacrifice the bishop to get your queen over there because bishop takes, knight takes, forks the king and the queen. So the bishop has to run backward, but okay, at least black's queen has some seventh rank protection, but queen takes h6 anyway. And even though black has a completely free move, there's not really a whole lot he can do. He tried rook a7 to put a lot of pieces to give lateral defense, but after knight to g5, there's simply no way to stop the pawn coming up to f7. You're going to have to sacrifice your queen because if you move your king to h8, there's no more protection over the square g7. The queen will just hop into g7 and give mate. In the game, black tried queen takes b5, f7 check anyway, and here we see it. When the king moves to h8, it's mate on g7. So black tried to take this pawn, but after rook takes f7, knight takes, black decided to resign. Now black is behind in material and getting attacked. That's not a good combo. You want to at least be ahead material if you're being attacked. And you guys can see the king can't take because it is yet another mate on g7. All right, Kasparov probably didn't need Walter Brown to show him how to sacrifice an h6, but a very similar idea nonetheless. Our next game is Vladimirov Apishin from 1987. Crazy chess game going on. Whose king is going to get checkmated first? Well, Vladimirov begins with rook on d to g1, doubling up on the g-file. Good things happen when the rooks work together. And black says, okay, before I stop any of your threats, I'm going to go ahead and get the queens off the board. I feel like that's a safer way to continue. So black plays queen takes queen. Now, the big question seems to be, which way to take the queen back? But you know, if you're going to make one of my videos, you can't just play a prosaic move like capturing the queen back. You've got to play a stunning bishop move. Well, if you've been paying attention to the first part of this video, you'll probably be able to figure out the winning move. That's right. Third time's the charm. Bishop to h6 once again wins the game by force. Here's the deal. If black decides to save his queen, I don't really know where. Let's just say he goes bishop grabbing and takes the one on h3. Then it's just mate and one. Rook to h7, shielding the black rook from taking our bishop, and it's mate on the spot. Okay, so we know why black can't save his queen. Let's say he tries to get rid of that pesky bishop and plays rook takes bishop instead. Well, now we play rook to g8 check. You can't take the rook because pawn takes knight. Promotion to queen is mate. And when the king takes, rook on 1 to g7. And because black didn't have time to take this bishop off the board, it's mate on the spot again. Really, really great move. Not taking the queen back and putting the bishop on the square h6. There's just no good move for black in this position. The actual game finished with knight to g4, trying to disconnect those rooks. Rook to h7 check anyway. Knight takes bishop. Rook takes h8 check. King takes. And white simply plays the Zwitschenzug rook h7 check before taking this queen back. And now white's just going to be ahead some material. When the king moves, let's put the king back, let's say, on this square. We'll just take the queen. And even though black temporarily has two minor pieces for the rook, this knight doesn't really have anywhere great to go. Rook h8 is a problem. And if you try a move like knight here, something like rook f1, that looks like it pretty much ends matters. The rooks are simply too strong. In our fourth example, we have Jan Timon's game from the late 1960s. We have a crazy position here where he's basically throwing all of his hopes on a mate on h7. In the actual game, he played rook h4, which I think was more desperation than anything. 
And after the queen gets sacrificed and rook takes, black was able to survive after pawn h5. It wasn't easy, but after bishop takes, black played g5, and he eventually survived because white's king was not so safe to be able to continue the attack. Okay, after the game, a lot of attention was placed on another move that white could have tried. Timon could have played queen to d2. Now here's the idea. After queen to d2, let's just say the rook is captured here. We have the amazing rook to h3, and black cannot prevent mate on h7 and save his queen. Of course, this video is not called stunning rook moves. It's called stunning bishop moves. So my question to you, dear viewers, what is the defense that black had to queen to d2? The antidote is the simply mind-boggling bishop to d3. Who could have ever found this move but the trusty computer? What does this move do? Well, that takes a little bit of explanation, but let me see if I can help you along. If the queen captures the bishop, then we can take the rook. When it's the queen traveling over to h3, white's attack is a little bit too slow because black's counterattack queen takes d4 works. There's going to be some back rank mates coming up on the very next move. So queen takes, not really going to get the job done. And if you play rook takes, black will just trade queens first. And after rook takes and takes, this rook is not in a position to get to the h file and checkmate black. So bishop to d3. Again, not clear if this would have been found in an actual game, but really, really great defensive move. And now black should be in a winning position. White's best try would probably be to play rook to h4 anyway, but now black will play queen takes d4 check, rook takes, black will grab the queen, and after rook takes, rook takes, this is a winning position for black. The extra pawns, the bishop pair, should be enough. We'll bring this mini-series on stunning bishop moves to a close with Gutmann Vitalinch, two Latvian players. Gutmann's been Latvian champion a couple of times, I believe, and he's an accomplished author. Let's see what he's got going on in this game. He's down a rook and a knight, but that black king is running out of shelter. Of course, white has a draw, but white actually missed a win in this position. The correct sequence that white should have done is to play queen h6 check first, then when the king moves... He could move his king, or he could castle queenside, but after a move like king to d2, I don't see a defense to the rook coming to g1, and there's going to be mates that follow. Unfortunately for Gutmann, he inverted the moves and played king d2 first, naturally thinking that he could always just play queen h6 check followed by rook g1 and pretty much get in the same position. What I'm asking of you is to find an amazing bishop move that defends black's king. Well, Vita Lynch found it in the game. It's bishop to d3. This is not a computer move because the human actually found it. The cool thing about bishop d3 is that it either forces the queen to retreat and get away from the black king, or it forces the king to come to an unfortunate square. If the king were to take on d3, then you've got the move queen e7, and you're threatening both to take the bishop and, most importantly, your queen has access to the 7th rank, which, oh by the way, would force a queen trade because the white king is on a bad square. Black went on to win the game. Let's take a look at queen takes before we leave. If the queen were to take, then you do have time to take the bishop. And if the queen were to return to g6, threatening similar ideas of going to h6 and putting the rook on g1, there's a couple ways for black to defend. Perhaps you could take on f2, although I think a more practical move is to play queen h4, stopping all of the checks, and if white does in fact make a battery, queen h7 seems to be defending, and white is out of pieces to continue the attack. So that was a nice bishop sacrifice that ended the attack. It's important to note that sometimes stunning bishop moves can be defensive moves also. I hope you enjoyed my little mini-series here on amazing bishop moves, and perhaps you'll get a chance to use them in your game. I realize I've not covered every single awesome bishop move in the history of chess. If you happen to have your favorite, please post it in the comments below. I'd love to see what I missed. Until next time, this has been FM Mike Klein for Chess.com.